Hello everyone. I'm really happy to be here and actually it's my third time at the conference and the second time in person so I'm really like happy that the conference is happening every year and it keeps growing and growing. Uh, so this time I'm going to present a talk about Alice Adventures. It's actually one of the part in the series of adventures, so I'm going to give like a short recap as well to get a better understanding of the story. But general, generally this time uh, Alice is going to learn how to use uh, Zeo Kubernetes library. I'm Roxelana, I work as Big Data Developer at Captify. Um, also I'm part of Women Who Cold Kiev community and uh, I often speak at various conferences and meetups. And uh, also I'm an active member of Ukrainian Scala community for the last uh, five years. And uh, now, as you all know, like when there is war in Ukraine, community is pretty active. People are constantly communicating, learning something new, which is uh, really great to see. We have like uh, online events. We are planning to do some offline catch-ups as well. So you can see that kind of in the space as well. There are streams of, on YouTube uh, with people sharing their knowledge around Scala. So in previous uh, talks or episodes uh, of what happened to Alice and how she got to the point of learning Zeo Kubernetes. So on her first adventure, Alice traveled uh, to the world of pods and higher order functions and her first stop was uh, Functional Forest where she saw the monads and the functors and she learned more about the functional nature of that world. And on the Kubernetes side, she learned how to create pods, uh, stateful sets, deployments, and her like, the main achievement was uh, creating the custom resource definition, which was uh, a magic database containing all of the knowledge about the world. So that magic database had a persistent volume, which she decided to take with her so she wouldn't forget about that adventure. And it happened so that uh, one of the parts of this uh, magic DB cluster tagged along with her. So two years later, she became a successful Scala developer. And, <laughs> yeah, and uh, she kind of forgot about that adventure. And uh, eventually she stumbled upon uh, the cave in the forest and uh, found out that the pot actually has been living in that world like two years and uh, was eager to come back home. And uh, she was trying to learn how to do that via Scala and she discovered one of the uh, Scala clients and created uh, like a launcher to launch the pot back home. And uh, three months later, um, Alice uh, kind of switched more to big data space and uh, she was trying to help a uh, data science team to uh, build like an MLOps pipeline. So they had this um, entity recognition model uh, where like for example uh, kind of a keyword search uh, whether in London today they could uh, classify what, that, what these words mean. So Alice uh, built this MLOps pipeline via Kubeflow and uh, in the end she got this message that the pods and higher order functions are in danger and that's how she understood that she needed to like travel back to that world and uh, figure out what happened to them. And five days uh, later on a Halloween night she had really like vivid dream like an adventure uh, where uh, she met the Mad Hatter and the Caterpillar and she got this riddle that she needed to uncover some anomalies uh, in the world and eventually they built this uh, anomaly detection algorithm which helped them to find anomalies and uh, decode the text that the past is the key to the future. And uh, that's how Alice knew that she needed to find out some records or some kind of history of that world to figure out what happened there. So later she discovered that there is this uh, Apache Delta Lake framework uh, that allows to like look through the data, build like a history, some kind of metadata and all of that. So Alice uh, created this record store uh, about the, from the persistent volumes that she had. And uh, in that record store, uh, there were various events that happened in that world, like the pods creation, uh, her uh, adventure to that world and how it changed uh, the world by the objects that she created and kind of took from that world. And uh, at some point she saw that there was like this major events uh, when the pods started to disappear and at some point all of them disappeared. So she knew that uh, she needed to get back to that world and figure out what happened. So this is where we are right now, like three days later after that discovery, Alice uh, was thinking um, about all of the events that she learned, that there is some kind of architect who built this world and that some major event happened which causes the pods to disappear. But uh, she didn't have like any ideas uh, how to get to that world, how to help the pods and uh, so she just decided to focus on work 
And uh, while she was working, she got this message that uh, like there is a way to help her friends. Uh, so Alice wasn't like really trusting that, uh, but she knew that she needed to travel to that world, although she like didn't know how to get there. So this anonymous uh, friend uh, suggested that there is some kind of passage to that world, and uh, if the instructions that this friend is going to give her are actually going to help her to get to that world. So Alice wasn't like really trustful in that case, uh, but uh, she didn't have any other uh, like opportunities to get there, so she decided to follow the instructions. So walking in the forest, um, like a dark park near the office, uh, she figured out that there is some kind of door with like a light going out of it uh, as a passage to that world. And uh, she went in and uh, she found herself in the functional forest. So she was like kind of back to the point one uh, where she was uh, a couple of years ago. And that's when she heard uh, like the pods talking to her. Those were pods Kafka 0 and Kafka 1 that she met uh, a couple of years ago for the first time. And uh, Alice decided to, tell, to ask them what actually happened there. And uh, the pods actually said that it's a long story. And truly, there were like a lot of events happening in that world over the time. So they decided to show her some place where they could tell her a story and also allow her to kind of help them. So on the way to the uh, like functional cave, as they called it, uh, they told her that uh, there were various events happening. First of all, a few months ago, uh, some new movement got started and uh, kind of like political movement where uh, some of the pods decided to separate uh, as with a slogan like freedom to the pods. And uh, not many pods actually supported that movement and uh, they didn't really understood like what's the essence of it. Uh, so at some point the pods just started to disappear, the ones who like supported the movement. So no one knew like where they were going, what's happening to them, and uh, everyone just continued with their lives, but uh, kind of the pods felt that there is some kind of uh, anomaly happening in the world. On one of the days someone uh, set uh, the factory on fire, uh, the factory where all of the Kubernetes objects were created, and uh, at that point, no one was able to create any new object in that uh, Kubernetes world. So they were like just staying as they were, with some pods getting more and more like uh, away from that world and disappearing. So again, a lot of uh, like anomalies happening. And at some point, some pods decided to escape to the functional forest because it seemed more safe, like uh, Kafka 0 and Kafka 1, they escaped to the functional forest. So Alice wasn't sure like after this whole story how she could help the pods because it seemed like really a lot of events happened and uh, she didn't know where the pods disappeared to. And uh, the pods mentioned that actually there is a way to help them but uh, there should be some kind of uh, layer in there because they are in the functional forest, like in the functional cave. So there is a layer between uh, the Kubernetes world and the way they can kind of talk to it. And for that, she needed to use uh, Zeo Kubernetes. So Alice did never used it before, but she used uh, like a set of various Kubernetes clients via Java, so kind of build it to use uh, with Scala, or Scala-specific clients, so she knew that she would be able to figure it out because they probably had like the same principles. So Alice started to research uh, what's special about Zero Kubernetes, and first that she saw that it's also like a client for the Kubernetes API, which uh, made sense. Uh, the Kubernetes API having multiple objects, like the usual pods, uh, stateful sets, deployments, and the client would allow to like work with those objects via update, delete, create, and uh, other operations, which is uh, like the typical way you work with objects. Another interesting feature is uh, code generation, which she didn't see in other uh, clients at all. Like mostly, um, if you would need to work with custom resources, you will need to specify a YAML file and then like build an object from it by calling some methods uh, on that object. While in Zeo Kubernetes, she saw that uh, it's possible to kind of create this uh, auto code generation from the YAML files, which seemed like the fun feature to try out. And another one is support of operators, and uh, the operators have been quite painful in all of the clients that she used, because uh, like there is no built-in functionality for it. Uh, there is usually something like an extension, so it was also interesting for her to try it out. So talking about the internals of the library, 
there are two parts, like a handwritten base code, um, the typical one, the tests, the creation of uh, like custom resources, and generated code. So this library connects uh, to the Kubernetes API and allows to auto-generate uh, creation of the objects. Uh, for example, like you have a pod, you have some parameters like metadata and specifications, the name of the pod and all of that, and it could be auto-generated from the Kubernetes API, which means there is no need for like additional boilerplate code. So the setup looked quite easy for Alice, um, just setting up a few dependencies like Zero Kubernetes client and um, SCTP client because there is a reliance on SCTP. So Alice started to build like an entry point to the library. First of all, it's necessary to set up a Kubernetes cluster config uh, and uh, there are multiple ways to do that, but one of the ways is to uh, have like a Hocon file config with environment variables that could be read from and then uh, she could reuse a type safe config to uh, get this file and kind of parse it and that's how she knew that those like environment variables are set up. Another interesting like the last line here is uh, about layering technique. Uh, so in all of the Kubernetes clients you usually work uh, with all objects at once like the whole API while uh, with uh, Zero Kubernetes it's possible to uh, work only with specific layer, like here's pods live, meaning she could work only with the pods, or she could specify deployments only, and that kind of allows to have this uh, more tight access control uh, to only specific objects. So Alice decided to get some of the pods that she knew to see like whether they're in the same namespace or not. So for that she needed to specify the namespace name, the name of the pod, um, handle the context info failure. So in the library there are like very specific errors in case of uh, the pod name missing in this case. So she just uh, matched on the name of the pod and retrieved the pod and uh, in case it's not there, the, uh, there is like a zero failure pod name missing, which is also like very specific. So she called this method that she created, uh, specifying default namespace because that was like the main city of the pods. And uh, she decided to set uh, MagicDB cluster one because that was like a pod brother of MagicDB cluster zero that she knew and that she helped to get back to that world. So she was hopeful that this pod is also in the same world. So she was like very excited to get this pod and try it all out. But there was no pod he was like missing and the other pods suggested that um, actually the pods getting disappeared probably moved somehow to another namespace uh, because like there is no way for them to go out completely. It's either they are removed or moved somewhere else. So uh, Alice decided to try out different combinations of the namespaces and she tried like multiple ones remembering that there is this uh, like a slogan of uh, pods freedom and one of them worked out. And that was pods freedom and she retrieved that there is actually this uh, pod uh, running in that namespace. The age was like two years which was the moment that she created the magic DB database. So it was the right pod. Mm -hmm. What she was also eager to find out is what's happening inside the pod as uh, each of the pods has a container running whether it's a database or a service. What she wanted to see it's actually the logs like what's happening there. For that she created this method called um, tail logs and uh, via that method she just needed to specify the name of the pod, uh, the name of the container and namespace to follow. And just print, print it all out into the console. Also interesting thing here is uh, the types uh, of the method, the return types. Uh, first of all it's like Kubernetes failure which is also like very specific and uh, pods with console type that allows to like print out all of the results into the console. So she called the method uh, tail logs uh, on the pod magicdb cluster one and the container name or image name is magicdb. And what she found out is that there are like errors in the pod uh, because uh, the persistent volume that stores the data is uh, not in the same namespace as that pod and therefore uh, as a database it wasn't able to find out the data storage. So Alice was thinking that the most obvious solution here would be to actually move the pod back from one namespace to another, but you are not like possible to do that uh, via just Kubernetes uh, like console or any commands. 
So she decided to do something very like brute force, just uh, change the namespace of the pod, and she could do that via like modification of the metadata of the pod. So she just needed to specify the default namespace and set it to the pod itself. But it didn't work. So Alice was thinking what else she could do and uh, uh, what she actually already discovered about this uh, library. First of all, she discovered that there is like much less boilerplate code in comparison to other libraries that she used. Uh, she need, didn't need to um, specify all of the methods on the pod creation, on the pod modification, so much less code, which is logical because most of the libraries she used were like Java clients and she needed to translate the code and the code was very like, Java-like style. Another feature that she liked is this access control where she could use only the pods and control only that set of resources instead of uh, having access to the whole API, uh, which was kind of more strict control, uh, more understanding of what's happening in your code as well. And another feature which she was already excited in is uh, code generation and she needed to try out custom resources just to understand how it works. So. Previously, she built this uh, kind of rocket launcher to move the pod from one world to another, and she thought that she could actually apply like the same principle and just build some kind of custom resource to move the pods from one namespace to another. So talking about custom resources, uh, those in general are j just an extension of the Kubernetes API because all of the objects in Kubernetes API are like basic objects that you have, pods, replica sets, stateful set, while custom objects are just an extension and you are able to specify just any object that you can imagine by specifying your own options to it, your own image, uh, building it and all that. So it's quite flexible and customizable. So she built this YAML file uh, for namespace train as she called it. Um, it looks like this, you have the kind of uh, custom resource definition, you specify the name, uh, the group, the versions, so this is all like metadata information. And then you specify something like an image, the number of replicas, which is uh, usually the number of the pods uh, of the custom resource, and uh, another information like uh, how you would uh, call this custom resource. We are like plural, singular name, and uh, the kind is uh, a generic one, as you see, because uh, usually when you write the kind in uh, Kubernetes, it would be like pod or stateful set, which is a uh, general API. For custom resource, it's the name of your custom resource because it's an extension. So she looked into the uh, Zio Kubernetes and uh, checked that actually she can just um, add this SBT plugin Zio Kubernetes CRD. And then there are only a few lines of code needed to parse that YAML file. First of all, just specifying this file, um, enabling code generation, and then calling just these two lines with the import of the name of custom resource and calling get on the name of the object, namespace train, and the namespace itself, which would be pods freedom. So Alice was kind of worried whether it's going to work out, but it looked very logical to her. But at some point, uh, like, the lights started to go, go out, so she didn't know what happened. And uh, the pods mentioned that there were like blackouts going on from time to time in that world because of the anomalies, and uh, that's why it's been like tough for them to build something. So Alice was really eager to try it out and kind of push uh, the same solution again. But then like uh, the lights went out and uh, the computer got destroyed and they understood that uh, like someone is trying to stop them from uh, helping the pods. And yeah, the story is to be continued and hopefully in the next adventure Alice uh, would be able to build an operator or something else and uh, figure out how to save the pods. So thank you for attention. Here's my contact info, Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, and Speaker Deck. I'll drop the slides on Speaker Deck and we'll share it in Twitter. Um, also, on Speaker Deck, you can find slides of all of the previous Alice adventures if you're interested in like uh, other clients to look into or Kubeflow or anything else. And uh, one more thing, um, as I mentioned, I'm from Ukraine and uh, I live in Kiev right now, so um, like we always need some kind of help and uh, donations from people and uh, if you want to help, there is no such thing like a small donation. Uh, so if you want to donate, you can go by that uh, QR code and use this link to donate. And uh, like it's been, it could be like tough for people right now with all the blackouts, as you saw in the presentation, and uh, people a bit struggling to work, but uh, 
uh, like we are managing that. So uh, thank you for attention and uh, all the questions you can ask in Discord or come to me after the talk. So, thank you.